really early in my Christian walk, I became a Christian when I was 18, and I had some, uh, I had a lot of zeal for God, and uh, and a lot of motivation in that, and sometimes I might have lacked wisdom, but I had passion, and uh, but as time went on, I discovered the power in the Word, and in waiting on God, and for short periods of time, I've grown in that over the years, but also in in the power of the word and the way that God not only speaks to us through his word, but he like he arms us and he strengthens us. And in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, um, it, uh, Paul here is praying for the church at Ephesus and he says, I keep praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you will know him better. And that's one of, the, one of the big things why the Holy Spirit is given to us, is so that we will know the Father better, so that we will understand more that revelation, you know, that understanding and revelation so that we will know the Father better, that we'll know his ways. You know, I often pray in my, my heart, you know, God, show me your paths, teach me your ways. And uh, just to know him better. It's part of a relationship, you know, getting to know people, getting to understand their heart, why they do things, what their life's about. And it's exactly the same with God. And uh, because at the end of the day, being a Christian is not all about being clever. It's not, you know, how wonderful we are or how much we know. But a big part of that is about being effective in what God's put on our heart and called us to do. I'd rather come across as a fool and that you get something from God from me or that the Holy Spirit works something in your life than to come and, and, and baffle you with great theological um, conundrums and you go, wow, man, that was really something. But you go away feeling empty and still hungry and, and not understanding what it was and sometimes feeling less in yourself because you think, oh, man, I don't know all that stuff. But, but again, Paul in Corinthians wrote that when he came to him, he said in, my, in, my, in Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 4 and 5, he said, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and power, so that your faith wouldn't rest on the wisdom of man, but on the power of God. And for stuff to happen in your life, you know, we need the Holy Spirit because it's not about how smart we are, but it's how powerful God is. And our faith, what can happen in my life, how my problems can be solved, how what, what my future contains, how how the Lord listens and answers to my prayer. It's not about how smart I am, but it's about the power of God. And so our faith should rest on the power of God rather than on our own wisdom. You know, and so today as we go through a few scriptures, if you write them down or, or watch later on, um, the main thing is, is if you be like the Bereans in Acts 17 11, and Paul said that the, um, that the Bereans were smarter than the than the average bear because instead of just listening they would go and search the scriptures to make sure those things were true so today don't just take my word for it um, but have a look yourself because God wants to give you a revelation he wants it to become part of you you know and Dave was talking about Jesus being the bread of life and you know like when we pray the Lord's prayer we you know give us this day our daily bread and that's not just about food it's about that daily word you know, his word that, that sustains us and feeds us and strengthens us. And daily he wants to give that revelation to us to continue to build us. So, life to the full. That's great. It's, um, it's not just for us, though. It's, it's, to, um, it's an active and uh, something that works in us uh, for prosperity and for producing for doing something outside of us and the life to the full in John 10 10 Jesus said I come to give your life to the full but the 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 enemy the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy he wants to take away from you in whatever way he can and he's sneaky but Jesus comes to give your life to the full so with the thief with him stealing he steals your peace he steals your faith he steals your love. He steals your joy. He tries to steal your future. He tries to steal your salvation. And he's a liar. And the Bible tells us that in the last days, men's hearts will be failing them because of fear. 
And part of that fear is, is because there's no hope for the future. What am I going to do? We were talking, having a discussion with some, some friends yesterday and we, it was mentioned about North Korea and about how everything is so locked up over there, the young people and a whole growing body of the people there have got no direction for the future. Everything's illegal. You can't do anything. There's no hope. And some of them refer to themselves as the living dead. Doesn't matter what we're doing, we're dead. And um, in that place is a personification of, the, of being, having everything stolen from the devil. But Jesus comes to give us life to the full and joy. You know, um, Nehemiah 8.10 says, The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord. And that joy of the Lord comes out of our relationship with him. That joy. And, um, and also Psalm 144 verse 15 says, Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. And we used to sing that old song, happy, happy is the people whose God is our Lord. Anyway, people used to sing it a lot better than me. You probably don't recognise it. It sounded like country music. But it was true that there is a happiness that, that pervades your life. The whole hippie movement, um, uh, in the, like in the movie The Jesus Revolution from back in the late 60s, early 70s, and um, where they were coming to salvation in droves and the joy of the Lord was their strength. And one of the things that marked them is they were like happy people. They were real happy. They were, and um, some of it got a little bit, you know, to the left or to the right, but it was the joy of the Lord that was their strength. And, and also when you have that understanding of God's presence and God living in you and God going before you, then you don't have to be working something up you don't have to be striving you can actually rest in that strength and and again Isaiah chapter 30 verse 15 it says in returning and in rest you shall be saved in quietness and confidence resting and stillness will be your strength so we don't have to motivate ourselves and and whip it up and start smacking ourselves and claiming this and claiming that and try to drum up our faith when we know God when we know the Lord, when the Lord is, has control of our life, there's a quietness and a strength that comes over your life. And in Daniel 11.32, it says, Those who do wickedly against the covenant shall try to corrupt with flattery, but the people who know their God will be strong and do exploits. And that comes out of that quiet strength, that understanding of God. So God has a plan. God's always had a plan. Um, it's hard in our minds to imagine that, that the Lord was always there. In him, there was no beginning. For the earth and for us, there was a beginning. But for God, there was no beginning. He always was and he always will be. And we can't get our head around that. But something in our heart bears witness to that and says, yeah, he is. Someone said this morning, from everlasting to everlasting. And we can trust in him. But God, besides having a plan, God's also got a process. And um, so we're not left alone in what we do. There's some things that we can understand about the word of God, about the purposes of God, and about the processes of God. They're going to help us in our prayer. They're going to build us in our faith. And they're going to make our lives more fruitful. And above all of that, it's like a cake that's iced with joy. Joy and peace. So, um, so God's got a plan. I've, I've been doing a look and I've noticed a few things and I've been looking a little bit further into it lately and just in my quiet time and reading the word and waiting on God, how much God's plan has already been, not only already been established, but it's actually been recorded. Like we're all familiar with the likes of Psalm 139 verse 16 where it says your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and in your book they are all written the days fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them so in God's book they were written there was something written in some book and in Revelation chapter 20 verse 12 and it says before the great right throne of judgment it says and I saw the dead small and great standing before the Lord and books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things that were written in the books. Books again. But the other thing that uh, recently I'd never seen before, but 
um, in my reading going through a few weeks ago, going through the book of Daniel, and you remember that Daniel had made a petition to the Lord and asked him for an interpretation of a dream that he had and things that were going on in the kingdom of Babylon there. And it took 21 days for the angel Gabriel to come and bring that translation to him, um, remembering but that back then the Holy Spirit hadn't been poured out like it is on us today. And so the angel Gabriel came and, and spoke to him about these things. And even though... Um, things were happening with the enemies on each side and the things that were going on in Babylon, Gabriel assured Daniel, and he said several times in chapters 8, 9, and 10, that the end will come at the appointed time. God's got a plan. And no matter what happens, the things will still happen in their appointed time. Now, it doesn't mean that everything's fatalistic, like everything is fate. So you just don't do everything and it'll all happen. It's not like that. God's got a plan for us and he's got a purpose for us. And God's plan and purpose is set out, but he knows the beginning from the end and he sees all time together and he's over it all. We still have our free will and we still have to make these choices. But God goes before us and God is behind us, watching our back. And so with this thing here, so besides saying to Daniel, besides Gabriel saying to Daniel that the end will still happen in its appointed time, it doesn't matter. Uh, in Psalms, it talks about the kings of the earth joining together and planning how they're going to, you know, their plans of destruction or the plans of taking over. And it says that God sits on his throne and laughs because his plan is established forever. And, and, but in Daniel chapter 10, verse 21, it's really interesting. You have a look there. And Gabriel says to Daniel, but I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. You go, oh, wait a sec, hang on. I don't think there was, Revelation wasn't written. A lot of the prophetic books weren't written. Daniel had been reading out of Jeremiah uh, previous to this. But the Lord said, the angel said to him that I'll tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. Again, referring to, I reckon, some of these books or the book that's in heaven, God's plan. God's plan and purposes for mankind and for us. And Psalm 119, verse 89, it says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Forever your word is settled in heaven. It doesn't change. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. In both directions. And now. So, let's start at the beginning. Thank you, David Siler. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word. In every beginning, we need the word. If we go running off without the word, what are we going in? Are we going in our own imaginations? Are we going in someone else's suggestion? Are we going because we felt compelled? Are we going um, because that was how we were taught? It's our culture. Really, a lot of those things don't guarantee success. Even as Matt was sharing about his financial situation, going in his own strength, trying to make things happen, you've just got to surrender to God and you've got to wait on him and understand that he has a plan. So John 1 verses 1 to 5, it says, In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him and without him, Nothing was made that was made. Without him, nothing, nothing was made that is made. And in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. Oh, I love that bit. See, when we have a word from God, to diverge a little bit here, when we have a word from God and we stand in faith, sometimes other people don't comprehend it. But the, the kingdom of darkness oftentimes just does not have a clue. But we can stand in our faith because God said. Because God said and we can trust him. And the darkness does not comprehend it. So in the beginning was the word. And the word was God and the word was with God. In John 14, 6 it says, And Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That has many different avenues in that. 
I am the way, the truth, the word, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We look at that and we go that Jesus is the only way to salvation. There's no name given under heaven by which men may be saved. But also, no man comes to the Father but through me. To me, personally, that means to me, we can go through the word of God to the Father. The, the importance of the scripture the way that it opens up for us a way to the Father, opens up our understanding. But there's power in the Word, and we'll see more of that later. But interesting in that, that when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that word truth there is a Greek word. It is aletheia, A-L-E-T-H-E-I-A, which means reality. It means the manifested, unconcealed essence of a matter. So Jesus is the reality, the manifest, unconcealed essence of a matter. So Jesus is the word of God personified, okay? So keeping that in mind, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. So in that, looking at that whole scripture there was how the world started. It wasn't how the heavens started. It's how our world started. How the earth and the heavens that we see. Not the eternal God and his eternal abode. That was forever. But this here, it says, in the beginning God... And that word God there, that Hebrew word there is Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M, which is actually a plural, which means God, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in the, in the beginning, there was the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the earth was formless and void. So there was already like a substance of it there, but it had no order and it was, it was void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering. <laughs> the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the deep. The Holy Spirit is never far from us. The Holy Spirit is never far from us. And the Holy Spirit was waiting. He was hovering, hovering like this. And God said, let there be light. So the word was spoken. Let there be light. And the Spirit of God accomplished it. And there was light. In Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 12, it says, Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am actively watching over my word to fulfill it. The Lord said to him, I am actively watching over my word to fulfill it. The Lord, the Lord there, the Hebrew there is actually Adonai, Adonai, which again is a plural, which is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So it's not just God the Father, but God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are active in watching over his word to accomplish it, to make sure that it is done. And it's interesting, you know, when we read in places like 11, uh, Luke 11, 20, Jesus said to the people, if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. But again, in Matthew 12, 28, it's recorded to him saying, if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. So Jesus, what he was doing, and this, this goes back, it, it, there's another sermon in there about um, the kinsman redeemer and about Jesus being fully God and fully man. So when he was on earth, even though he was fully God, Philippians tells us that he laid aside all that and he became man and he humbled himself and became even lower than the angels. So everything that Jesus did here on earth, he did not by his power as the word of God, he did it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And the reason why he did that is that if he did anything as the son of God, he could not be our redeemer because man sinned, so man had to die for our sins. And um, so in the way that that works, 
if you remember when Jesus was baptized by John in the River Jordan, it said Jesus came and he was baptized and the, and the Father spoke out of heaven when Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit and he said, this is my beloved son who I'm well pleased. Shortly after that, I think it uh, could be Luke 4, where Jesus goes in, the Holy Spirit draws him into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. And he was there and the devil came, angels ministered to him, but the devil came and tempted him and said to him, if you want all this kingdom, you bow down to me and I will give you all this kingdom that you see. And Jesus said, it is written, you know, serve the Lord the God and him only. And he said, you've been fasting 40 days, you're hungry, turn these stones into bread and eat. And Jesus said to him, no, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the Father and the Son. And the devil said to him, well, took him up the top of, of this cliff and he said, or the temple, and he said, throw yourself off and God's angels will come and swoop you up and protect you. And Jesus said, no, it is written, don't test the Lord your God. Because Satan actually come and used the word of God as well, he said, because doesn't it say in the word that his angels give charge over you lest you cast your foot against the stone? And Jesus said to him, no, but the word is also written, don't tempt the Lord your God. And then the devil left him. But at the end of those verses, it said, then Jesus came out of the desert in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why he says, these things that I have done, you will do and greater things will you do because I go to my Father in heaven and I'll get him to send you, Alos Parakletos, another one, the same as me, the Holy Spirit. And we'll get into some of that later. So these things that Jesus did, so he said, I cast out demons by the finger of God. I cast out demons by the Spirit of God. But then in Matthew, so we have the Spirit of God working. We have him hovering, waiting for the word so he can accomplish the word. Okay? And we don't want to just keep him on hold because, I don't know, maybe beep, beep, beep. You know, you leave him on hold too much and he goes, oh, well, I've got a game of golf at two. Anyway, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 19. And Jesus came and he spoke to them and he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. You go, therefore, make disciples, cast out demons, heal the sick, preach the good news to the poor. But Jesus himself then has given us his authority. He's the one, all authority, go in my name. And these signs, Matthew, uh, sorry, Mark 16, 17, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. In my name. In Jesus' name. So now we have, we have the authority of Jesus. We have the word. And then with the word, when we speak with the authority of the word, the Holy Spirit's there to accomplish it, to bring it. And the Holy Spirit is hovering, waiting. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Jesus is saying, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father. So the word is entwined and, and completely connected to the will of the Father. And we know that the Bible tells us that if we pray according to his will, then God will hear our prayers. But it's his will, not our will. Our will is so tainted, it's got so much stuff connected to it. And even sometimes when, when we think our will is so pure, we still have that pride and arrogance connected to it. Um, though the Bible tells us that a humble and a contrite heart, God will never turn away. So when we seek the Father and seek his will, teach me your ways. Show me your paths. And also then, as we get to know the Father and get to know the word, your word have I hidden in my heart that I will not sin against you. That our motives are pure and our prayer is pure. So they work together, the will of the Father. And we've got to understand that the will of the Father, the will of God, is, is tied up in the love of God. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. The most valuable thing that he sent his son in exchange for us to take the blame for every bad thing that we've done 
so that we could be forgiven. And he came. The son came. And even in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was, when Jesus, who was pure man, as he'd set aside his, his godhood, pure man was there and he saw that what was before him. And the will of God was so manifest in his heart. The purpose of God was so manifest in his heart. And he was praying and sweating droplets of blood and saying, Lord, Father, if this is at all possible, can you let this pass by me? Is there another way? Is there another way? But Lord, Father, if there's not, I submit to your will. Let your will be done. And so he also driven by the Son, driven by love, like we want to get to that place where God's will is so manifest in us when we say, Lord, just let your will be done. I won't count the cost because your way is perfect. And so we have the will of the Father. We have the authority of Jesus and we have the power of the Holy Spirit. But it all began in the beginning was the Word. So in our beginning, in our beginning, we have to start with the Word. We can't start with a meme. We can't start with a sermon. We can't start with a suggestion. We can't start with a cliche or an idea or any other foolishness that comes out of our, our own mind. Our own thoughts are, are foolishness, the Bible tells us, in the Lord. But the Word of God is perfect. And so we, we need to know this Word. We need to read through it. I, I read the Word like a pirate. I does. I open these words up and I have a look in there and I dig around and, and I see all these things so I mark them where the treasure is and I can go back and get it later. <laughs> That's an Australian pirate. <laughs> I'm not real good at, I'm not good in impressions. Though I do really good, I do a real good impression of Dallas. Do you want to see it? See, because he's a foot taller than me. Anyway, <laughs> um, so yeah, read the word. And it's amazing that as you're reading the word, it just comes alive. And remember that the Bible says in these last days, in, in Acts it tells us, from the book of Joel, it says, in the last days, the Lord said, I will pour my spirit out upon all flesh. And if he's pouring his spirit out upon all flesh, remember Paul prayed for the Ephesians, I pray that God will give you the spirit of revelation and understanding so you will know him better so when the holy spirit is poured out upon us we know that the word is going to come alive we know that we're going to understand the plans and the purposes of god better we're going to understand his ways but we are going to be also more willing lord i know you i know your heart man i'll do i'll do anything for you lord anything anytime anywhere because that's the best place i can be and so we're down to the word of God. So we need the word first because the Holy Spirit is hovering, remember? And um, the Holy Spirit is hovering and waiting for the word of God. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 said, And the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, even piercing to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It's amazing. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, when it tells us to put on the whole armour of God, when it talks about the word, it says, and take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And I thought about that because the spirit's capital S. So it's the sword of the Holy Spirit, which is the word of God. So the word of God is, is like the sword in the Holy Spirit's hand. So when the Holy Spirit is active, and waiting he is armed and dangerous he has the word of god and at that word things are established things are built things are activated it's a great sword but for, remember for us acts 1 8 and you shall receive power but you but you shall receive power me you and it's as Joel said, on your manservants and maidservants, it wasn't reserved just for the high priests or for the, the really deserving ones because there's no such thing. 
we're all really deserving actually, but we're really deserving of judgment rather than favour of God, but by the grace of God. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Jamaria, to the remotest parts of the earth. And you know what? That's why it's written in Daniel 11.32 that the people who know their God will be strong and do exploits. Know the word. Read the word. Let it get inside of you. God wants to work in us. We've got a generation that is, that is dying so much from hope, suffering from hope, doing all sorts of things that are... I was talking to some friends out the uni of the group I was in there um, earlier in the week and I mentioned to them about, like, the, one of them's a doctor of Duvalaki and the other, a couple of others, are, uh, two of them were pastors and uh, another couple of real edu well-educated people and a couple of hillbillies, me and my client. And, um, and I mentioned about how in Queensland they got, like in all parts of Australia, they got late-term abortion. So a baby, even when it's being born and the head is crowning, they give it a lethal injection in the head to kill it. And you go, and they go, what? No way. Got my phone out, Google, see? And it's been, it's been law for a while. And I said, it's not only that. Man, it gets even, if it can possibly get worse than that, it gets worse than that. That if the lethal injection doesn't work or the other things they do for abortion doesn't work and the baby is born and is lying there ready to be thrown in the bin and is still alive, it is illegal to help the baby. You have to let it die. And you go, what, the, what type of world are we living in? And because of the people can get understanding of some of the conspiracies and things that are going on in the world, and sometimes it, it invades our mind and it invades our heart and it invades our imaginations so that all we can see is doom and gloom and that there's just hopelessness and some people can't handle that. And even within the church, there is people that are feeling that and so they're hanging out, I'm just waiting here for the rapture bus, you know. <laughs> Hope it's not too long. <laughs> you know, take me home, Lord. But it's, but it's not like that. You know, um, we're, we're here as a witness. We're here as a lighthouse. We're here to display the goodness and love and the grace and mercy of God. And um, for us to do that, we have to have that in us. Colossians 1.27, God chooses to put his glory into broken earthen vessels. And so that people see the glory of God through our life, through the hard things we go through, through who we are. And that's why Acts 1.8 says, and you will receive power to be a witness to me. And that doesn't mean that everyone's going to stand on the street corner. It's about being a witness in your everyday life, in the things that happen in the life, and the things that you do and the life that you live. And there's some great stories here. God has written his word on your heart. You are his living epistles that people see you when they read you. So, at the end, a challenge and a response. Where, where do you stand today? Where do you stand? And my opinion of where you stand doesn't matter. But it's where you stand and where you want to stand. Um, or are you even standing? Are you finding it difficult to stand? Are you feeling a bit confused? Are you feeling like you're forgotten or left out or good things happen to everyone else but not me or, Lord, I feel like the heavens are brass and I can't hear you. But I want to tell you the Holy Spirit is not far from you at all and God loves you. And there's an amazing, amazing scripture in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8. And it said, And I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Lord, here am I, send me. So the first thing is just that we say to the Lord, I'm available, Lord, here am I, send me. But amazingly enough, at the same time, Isaiah had a revelation of his own shortcomings and his own uncleanness. And he said, 
Woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips. But the angel of the Lord took a coal from the altar, touched it on his lips, and he was cleansed. And the channel was open and he had a conversation with God. And for us today, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. I just want to ask you, if it's in your heart and you're saying, here, my Lord, send me. I don't understand it, Lord, but send me. God, I need you. I tell you, it doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are. Short, tall, qualified, unqualified. Usually unqualified gets the job done. I want to invite you, if you'd like to come, we'd love to pray with you. I'd love to lay hands on you and pray that the Lord would fill you afresh with His Holy Spirit, a passion for His Word, and confirmation in your heart of your purpose in God. They're the things that the Lord wants to speak to you personally. He wants to whisper it in your heart. Because a lot of time it doesn't come like like Elijah when he was on the side of the mountain he was waiting for the Lord and and there was great thunder and lightnings but God wasn't in that and and there was earthquakes and rocks falling and everything but God wasn't in that and there was a mighty wind and God wasn't in that but there was that still small voice that God spoke to his heart a lot of times we do look for the other things and we think man Pick me, say something nice about me, you know, or I wish I had that award, you know. Wish people noticed how well I was dressed today, you know, how long my legs are, or whatever it is. But that only, that fades very quickly. But when the Lord speaks to you, and just speaks to your heart, that's the bread. Man doesn't live on bread alone, but only every word that proceeds from the mouth of God.